and then I'll copy and paste in here. It seems that I haven't given you people permission to talk. Forgive me about that. Not that I don't trust you. What I do. So what I'm going to do, inshallah, I'm going to begin straight away and I'm going to hand over. Uh, we are recording. I'm going to hand over straight away to Altaf. And thankfully, uh, many of you did provide us with some questions beforehand. So bless me Allah. Let me hand over to Altaf, please. Okay, Salaam Alaikum. Yeah, I'm here. Hello, okay. Salaam Alaikum, everybody. I think there's 82 participants at the last count, so I think that's brilliant to see. I'm not going to be too long, so I know we're a little bit behind time, so I'm going to be as quick as I can, Kay. Okay? Don't worry. And then I'll very quickly move over to Saida, and then we will move over to you, and then we'll come back again. So, firstly, you know, friends, colleagues, thank you so much. I'd like to just say, how brilliant you've been over the last 12 months. It's been 12 months of actually having to do all sorts of things. And, you know, you've shown so much courage, leadership and integrity over the last 12 months. And I, I salute you. You know, I'm really, really proud of you. I cannot even start thinking about the obstacles that you've had to overcome over the last 12 months, but you've stepped up. And in a couple of weeks time, folks, you are going to have to step up again, you know, so that we're from the 12th, we will be going into a really important part of the, the Muslim calendar in terms of our fasting. And I know you will dig in deep again and dig into that courage and grit and resilience that you've shown over the last 12 months. And actually for many of us over the last number of years, we are seasoned warriors in terms of Athi Ramzan and having to deal with obstacles. Of course, this year has has been even more difficult than in previous years but I know that we as a community and as a college will come together and, and get through it and many of you will already have your tips and your toolkits over the last few years and I think the purpose of this session is just to identify any gaps and I'm really pleased that we've got people like Saida, Kay, Ellie for the doctor in a few uh, minutes time to have to talk about diet and nutrition and Islamic stuff etc. My purpose for being here is first to say thank you to all you all but also to remind you what we have done to kind of make those reasonable adjustments for all of our students. So many of you will have brothers and sisters who will have gone back full time to their school or college. And you will notice that we will be continuing with our blended delivery model until we commence in the 7th of June. Now we made that decision a few weeks ago and that is slightly at odds with the guidance, but we did that for a number of reasons. Firstly, COVID hasn't gone. You know, the rates of infection in Luton are still three times the national average. The testing was OK. It wasn't as much as we would like it for our college students. And also a big one was rooms on, you know, if about 50 percent of my students are going to be fasting during the assessment period. We felt those were three big ticket items that we felt lent themselves for us to continue with our blended delivery model. And we feel that's a big adjustment. And when I spoke to government officials, they hadn't quite fed that into other schools and colleges. So the good news is because of what we are doing and the work that all of us have done and Kay and Elif and thank you to you guys, that has been fed through to national level. So have you thought about Ramzan? Have you thought about Muslim students? So we are kind of pioneers in that regard. So that's the, the, the one bit. The second bit, just personally, I've been here for 16 years and been fascinated over those 16 years. And every year I'm really proud that I've been educating non-Muslims every year. And I think that's part of our job, our duty. And every year I've had at least 10 new people say to me, oh, it must be really hard. It must be really tough, but at least you can have a drink. And then every time I kind of educate them over what that is and what it means. And thank you for all of you for educating friends, colleagues and non-Muslims because they really need to understand what a big deal it is for us to be fasting over this period of time. And there's quite a lot of questions that I've seen. I think we'll address some of the myths, etc. So yes, it may come as a surprise. I do have a shower every day when I'm fasting. I do brush my teeth. It may not come across like that. There were some questions on them lines. And I think it's sort of very important that we're very open and honest. There's no such thing as a bad question. And I'm hoping those questions will be asked. So I will stop there in a moment. I'll come back again, but thank you. You, you. I'm so proud of all of you for what you've been doing. And I'll just hand over very quickly to an esteemed colleague of mine, Saida, in terms of actually just her her experiences and her input. 
Okay, thank you, Altab, and salam alaikum to everyone. And and um, I really feel honoured to um, address you here, even if it is only for a couple of minutes. Um, so for uh, many of the students won't know me, but my name is Saida Megjean. I'm the director of HR here at the college. Um, and like Altab, as long as I've been working here, um, every Ramadan I've been fasting as well. And it is. Um, really lovely to fast in a community um, such as Luton Sixth Form College where we have so many staff and students who are participating in the same event and that that's what makes it possible and makes it really fun. I think from my perspective um, it's no doubt really really difficult and and I find it difficult every year I have to admit um, but I think as I've gotten older I feel that um, I sort of uh, look forward to it a bit more than I ever did when I was a bit younger and I think the reason for that is that it really does teach me the um, possibility of the willpower, you know, the power of the will, as it were. Um, and if anyone and, and those participants, colleagues who know me, uh, know that in regular times I have very little willpower, particularly when it comes to cakes and chocolates or anything like that. Anything sweet, you know, is, is sort of my, um, my Achilles heel. But in Ramadan, I find it really easy to have that willpower. And, you know, I think that that's obviously coming from the spirituality of the month and the fact that we're doing it together. But I see it as a really important time for me to regain the control of my life, <laughs> regain the control of myself, my body, um, and of course, uh, reconnect with Allah. So, um, you know, I wish you all a really blessed Ramadan. Um, and I hope, you know, it's been a really hard couple of years for us, not being able to go to the mosque and not being able to see our families and have iftar together. Uh, and inshallah, maybe next year we might be able to do some of that. Um, but until then, we can kind of remember each other in our du'as and, um, you know, pray for each other in this most blessed month. So Ramadan would mubar to you a bit early, 15 days to go almost, or 16, I think. Um, and um, I hope you all have a wonderful Ramadan. Thank you, Altaf. Thank you. Thank you, Saida. Just very quickly, some questions have come through to me which might be of relevance to, to Altaf or Saida, I'm not sure. So yes, you can send your questions to me. I'm receiving them in the chat, so please keep doing that. I don't know what's happening with our larger chat function. Sorry about that. But one thing that uh, students have asked, they've asked specifically what would happen to them if they need extra support? What can, what can they, what can they uh, do in that process? Bismillah, if you can be so kind. OK, you broke up. I think it's about what support the students will be getting during that period. Did I get that right? You broke up a little bit, Kate. Did I get that right? Yes. Yeah. OK, yes. so I think what we also, and I should have actually mentioned that. So what we did because of some of the guidance that was shared with us by Elifa and by Kay is that we had, we've had conversations with, with heads of faculty, with progress coaches, and as we would do in any other year, we will make all reasonable adjustments. We understand how difficult this is. We understand that the rooms aren't coincide with the assessment period. And these are kind of schedules inflicted on us. And if you are struggling, the key thing is don't keep that to yourself. Please share that information with your teacher, with your progress coach, with someone. And then we will look at things on a case by case basis and do whatever we can reasonably to make those adjustments because we don't want to add extra pressure if we possibly can do. OK, thank you very much. So that's the key message here for our students that we really want to make it clear that the college is saying we will try our best to help you in different ways as long as you can let us know. So speak to your progress coaches, speak to your teachers, don't don't keep it to yourself. It's going to be a bit of a different one this year, which is why we've got uh, Dr. Monjo Ahmed coming in as a guest speaker, inshallah, and some of the things that we're going to be running through. So uh, I'm grateful to both Altaf and Saida for being here to help support with this and to get those messages across to everyone. But the thing we do want to stress is the following, that look, it's going to be a little bit different this year. It's our first time fasting in an institution whilst the middle of COVID, and uh, we are aware of that. Therefore, the college is going to support you in ways that we can, which doesn't disadvantage your learning. And alhamdulillah, uh, as Altaf mentioned, he's managed to go um, and speak on a national level. So Ramadan is being considered from a national point of view because unfortunately it was forgotten about. Uh, I don't think that was intentional. I just think yeah. everyone's so yeah. 
busy with everything else. But alhamdulillah, uh, like we are very blessed to have people like Altaf and Saida in senior positions that can have these conversations on a national level. So inshallah, it will benefit Muslims uh, from everywhere else. So what I'm going to quickly do now, still keep your conversations coming, keep your chats coming to me. I, I, I can see them. So inshallah, I'll pick them up as we go along. I'm going to begin with um, a quick session on the fiqh of fasting. So I'm going to share my PowerPoint. And I will say this, uh, forgive me, it, it will be a little bit rushed, but uh, both Elif and I are happy to still hang around after five o'clock to um, go through things with a bit more detail and to take even more questions and then have an even bigger Q&A. And our PowerPoint that we're going to be using now, we will be sharing with you guys. We'll be uploading it on source and I'll send it out to everybody who's attended. So we've put a lot of detail on the PowerPoint. Don't think that we're going to go through that uh, right now. That's not the case. Uh, so it's there for your information as well. Some of the questions you put forward, uh, you were so kind to do that when we registered. So bless you all for doing that. And I'll try to address those uh, as we go along, inshallah. So hopefully, inshallah, you can see the PowerPoint. Uh, um, so Al Altaf Saida, can you see the PowerPoint? Is that there? Is, is that? Yes, yes, we can yes, see yes. next. Brilliant. Thank you, Kay. So you've had, you've heard from Altaf, uh, our principal and CEO. You've heard from Saida, who's our director of HR. Now, here I am with a very crash course. Uh, forgive me, my teachers would um, chastise me severely if I'm going to be doing this in 10, 15 minutes, but what can I do? Such is life. So now you're going to have a crash course on uh, the fiqh of fasting. Bismillah. So here we go. Now, what is Ramadan and why do Muslims fast? And if we address some of that in her talk, which is about spirituality. Uh, so Ramadan is the ninth month of the Islamic calendar. It's approximately going to start 12th of April and last until 12th of May, give or take a day. And approximately fasting will be from four in the morning until eight in the evening. But you will have to check the calendars. That's just an approximation. Why do we fast? In short, short version, from my perspective, because uh, we are told to. The Quran makes it very clear, and you have a quote there from Surah Baqarah, chapter 183. Uh, o you who believe, fasting is prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before you, that you may be mindful of God. So there's a lot going on, but the short version is it is a pillar for Muslims. Uh, it's one of the five pillars. It's one of the fundamentals of this religion. We are expected all to fast unless we are exempt from fasting. So not everyone will fast. So I briefly want to talk about exemptions. Okay, bismillah. So exemptions, there are medical exemptions and these medical exemptions fall into two categories. There are temporary exemptions and there are permanent exemptions. So a permanent medical exemption means somebody will never be required to fast. Fasting will just be too harmful for their health. It just will not happen. In that circumstance, and that's part of a conversation with your medical professional, what I would say is the Islamic ruling is you do not fast whatsoever. And for every fast that you cannot fast, you will pay something called fidya, which works out as three pound per fast. So somebody who permanently doesn't need to fast, they will pay about 90 pound per month. Um, temporary medical exemptions. So you could be healthy today and then something could happen, God forbid, for 10 days, the doctors say absolutely not. And that could include COVID, right? And inshallah, when Dr. Ahmed comes, he can talk about that. So for that temporary medical exemption, you will not be fasting and you will not be paying fidya. Instead, what would happen when you're fit and healthy again, uh, you would do what we call qada fast. Now, qada is on the slide. It just means make up fast. It means if you miss a fast, you still owe that fast. So it's not like, OK, Monday I didn't fast. That's the end of it. No, you still owe that Monday and you will have to do that at some point in your life. The sooner, the better. That's called qada. Um, for a medical reason, there is absolutely no sin on any person for not being able to fast in Ramadan. And inshallah, when their health improves, they will just carry on and do that with our fasts that they owe. Oh, could be one, it could be five, whatever it is. And that would happen. Um, if someone is on menses, they don't fast, obviously. And when they finish, they make up what they've missed with Qadha fasting. If you're pregnant or breastfeeding, you don't automatically not fast. But if that fasting would cause um, harm, to both the mother or the child, then you're medically exempt temporarily. Qadar fast once again, so you don't actually 
to fast then, you fast when you're feeling better. That could be a year from, from now, even, like through the pregnancy and breastfeeding, whatever. But you, you will owe that, inshallah. And traveling, um, you don't have to fast if you're a traveler. You may choose not to, and that's fine. Um, but in the instance of outside of traveling, you will just owe qada. So these are the legitimate exemptions. People don't need to be doing that. And the medical exemption is very important. Inshallah, we'll speak more about that with Dr. Monjo Ahmed. Now, what is actually required to fast? So here are the obligations needed to fast. Number one, you must have an intention to fast. So the best way for me to explain that is the night before you want to fast is intend in your heart consciously. Oh Allah, I intend to fast for you tomorrow in the month of Ramadan. That doesn't have to be in any other language. It could be in English. It could be in Urdu, Bengali. It doesn't matter what language you intend it in. That's fine. Um, in the Hanafi school, you need to make that intention every night. If you wake up for suhoor, that will satisfy it. That will be enough as an intention. But to make things easier for you, I want to give you a position from Imam Malik and Imam Ahmad. Uh, Both of them have said, if a person intends to fast the entirety of Ramadan in the beginning of Ramadan, that will suffice as an intention. But it's better to make that intention every night. So, oh Allah, I intend to fast for you the next day. Moon sighting. So obviously you can only fast in Ramadan when it's Ramadan. Otherwise, it's just an extra fast. And, and moon sighting is complicated. I'm happy to talk a bit more about that in the Q&A. Uh, and finally, what you have to do, you have to avoid what we call the nullifiers. Now, nullifier basically means something that will, if it happens, you're no longer fasting. OK, and I'm going to quickly talk about those. So nullifiers, there's two types. There's something that we call a break, which uh, may not be sinful at all and only requires a qada. So you only need to make up what you missed that day. So something could happen. It broke your fast. That's OK. Make that up. And then there's another type of nullifier, which is referred to as a serious break. In this instance, a person will be sinful. They will have to make up the qada. And there's something called kafara. Kafara is basically a penalty. So if you have to do kafara, you have to fast for 60 days back to back, one day after the other, including the fast that you owe. So imagine you've got one qada and you broke it with a serious break, you would end up fasting for 61 days back to back. For women, what would happen? You fast, you fast, you fast, you have your menses, you have a break. When your menses is stopped, you fast, you fast, you fast. 60 days is over. If you have 20 or 30 or 50 serious breaks, one kafara will suffice for all of them. So you don't need to do 60 every time you've done this. But inshallah, try and avoid it. There's only three instances where it's a serious break and these are the following eating or drinking intentionally something which is desirable while you're fasting so imagine you're walking home from college you walk past the chicken and chip shop you smell it you say mm, that sounds nice i want a chicken burger i don't care that i'm fasting and you go and get it you have a serious break uh, you owe that fast and you owe kafara the second thing is taking medicine unnecessarily so if you didn't need to take the medicine and you took it your fast is broken, you owe qadar, you owe kafara. And the final thing, which hopefully no one's doing anyway, uh, unless you're married, sexual relations while you're fasting. Right. So if you do that while you're fasting, your fast is broken, you owe qadar, that's uh, you owe kafara. That's it. So only these three conditions would lead to a serious break and kafara. All right. Now. A normal break, these are some of the ones that are common and based on some of the questions that you've said. So if any of these happen, your fast is broken. You need to repeat that as a qadar. There may or may not be any sin. Uh, asthma, I'm going to talk about shortly in a second. So thank you. I've got a question coming through for asthma. I'm going to talk about it. So one thing that will break your fast in the Hanafi school, accidentally eating or drinking. Uh, the best way I can describe that is with bullet point two, swallowing water when you're making wudu so you know you're fasting you go to wash and you accidentally drink water and you say oh no i was fasting um, in that instance in the hanifi school you owe that fast you've broken it however as a bit of leniency for your students there are other opinions i think in the shafi school if you accidentally broke your fast they say carry on um, but in the hanifi school that's not the case eating something which is not desirable will break your fast so if you're a habitual fingernail eater if you eat your fingernails, you're uh, you've broken your fast. Swallowing blood from the mouth, 
providing you can taste it and providing your saliva is changed. If you're aware of it, it broke your fast, you owe qadar. Pouring water into your ear, I don't know why you would do that, but if you've got a jug and you pour water into your ear, that will break your fast. This is the important one. Breaking the fast due to sickness. No kafara, no sin, you just owe qadar. This is very important right now. So um, you may become unwell when you're fasting. That could be because of COVID or it could be because of anything else. If you are in a position, and this is in some ways a medical discussion, uh, where you are really unwell, then you break your fast medically, you are exempt for that day and rest and recover and make that fast up. Sometimes, look, fasting is hard. It might be you just take a minute to yourself, you go sit down or lie down for 20 minutes, half an hour. You might feel better, you carry on. But if you are unwell, you break your fast, okay? That's important to recognize. And, and Islam understands that. And really, we need to stress that right now. If you're really unwell, you break your fast. No sin, just make it up when you're feeling better. Smoking breaks your fast. Sorry about that, everybody. So if you smoke, um, that's the end of that. Uh, having no intention to fast, like I mentioned, we've discussed that already. Swallowing food in the mouth, which is more than the size of a chickpea, that will break your fast. So imagine you've had your early morning suhoor and there's some food left in your mouth and fajr is in and you swallowed it. If that food is larger than a chickpea, you owe a fast. Somebody asked about vomiting, so I have to talk about this. Induced vomiting of more than a mouthful. What that means is, is if you forced your own self to vomit, and I don't know why you do that, but if you did and you vomited more than a mouthful, in that situation, you have broken your fast. If you forced yourself to vomit, but you only vomited a tiny little bit, your fast isn't broken, keep going. Now, why would someone do that? I don't know. But that's one of the ways that vomiting can invalidate your fast. Taking an inhaler in the Hanafi school will invalidate your fast. However, there are other opinions that say it won't. So somebody mentioned asthma. I find it difficult. Um, it would, you'd be okay. Now, somebody said water goes in my ear. Will it break my fast? Only if you intentionally pour it into your ear. So I don't know why you'd have a jug of water and you would pour it in your ear. Accidentally, I'll come to that in a second. Um, ejaculation, whether it's masturbation or anything else, it will break your fast, but you only owe qadar, not kafara. So be aware of that. Now, things that do not break the fast. In the Hanafi school, eating something while you forget. So imagine you forget your fasting, you go to your fridge, you take out a bottle of water, you drink it, you say, wow, that was so delicious and thirsty. Then you say, oh my God, I was fasting. That's okay. Forgetfully fasting is no problem. In fact, that's based on a hadith. It's called a mercy from Allah. So, I mean, good luck if you manage to have a three course meal forgetfully. But nonetheless, that's there. Eye drops don't break your fast. Smoking accidentally. So if you walk past someone and smoke goes in and you breathe it in. My first question to you is why weren't you wearing your mask? It's COVID time. Keep your mask on. But secondly, if that happened to you, your fast is not broken. Carry on. This is important. Taking anything through the veins or muscles, vaccines, blood tests, injections in the muscles or the veins do not break your fast at all. Please communicate that message to your parents or anybody else who's eligible for a vaccine. What about swimming? No, swimming will not break your fast, providing you don't drink the swimming pool. Um, so vaccines, it's very important for you to know vaccine will not break your fast. Medication in the arm will not break your fast. Giving blood will not break your fast. So you can go for a blood test while you're fasting. You can donate blood if you're healthy enough to do that while you're fasting. Swallowing something less than a chickpea does not break your fast. So suhoor is ended. You've got a tiny bit of rice in your mouth. You swallowed it. That's fine. Vomiting again. Now, if you vomit and you didn't cause that, you just unwell and you vomited, right? If it was a mouthful of vomit that you swallowed, then you have broken your fast. But if you just puke everywhere without causing it, you haven't broken your fast. You may stop fasting because, um, you know, you may feel unwell. But just vomiting everywhere alone will not break your fast and as long as you didn't cause that vomiting. Experiencing a wet dream will not break your fast showering will not break your fast unless you're standing under the shower trying to drink all the water please don't do that and even in showering if water accidentally goes in your ear that's fine it doesn't break your fast 
at all. So water going in your ear accidentally doesn't break your fast. So I'm saying that because there's a lot of questions coming in about that. Um, finally, some clarifications before I hand over to Elif. And inshallah, towards the end, we'll do a more detailed Q&A. Things that you need to be clarified. So suhoor, you know, the pre-dawn meal is not a condition of fasting. If you skipped um, fasting, if you skipped suhoor, it doesn't matter. You can still fast. Now we're going to talk to um, Dr. Ahmed to find out what his advice is about suhoor and whatever else because of the impact on your sleep. But it's not something that will you need to do. Taraweeh is not an obligation. So you don't have to pray taraweeh. You don't even have to do it in a mosque. You can pray taraweeh at home. In fact, it could be very well better for you to do that this year. You can brush your teeth with you when you're fasting, but it's better not to. Uh, that's makruh, but you can do. Um, the fast begins when fajr begins. So fajr is like a two hour window. As that starts, like 3.45, that's it. You, you start fasting, not at 4.45. Um, Swearing doesn't break your fast, but obviously don't do that. Fighting doesn't break your fast, but please don't do that, especially at college or anywhere else. Lying doesn't break your fast, but please don't do that. Um, backbiting doesn't break your fast, but please don't do that. Most of the sins will not break your fast, but they can put you in a position where the reward you would gain from your fast is capped. So be aware of that. Bleeding doesn't break your fast unless for some random reason you decide to drink the blood hopefully you won't do that wearing makeup on its own will not break your fast um, there may be other issues to consider but nonetheless doesn't break your fast not praying does not break your fast or in invalidate your fast i would hope in ramadan muslims are praying because it's a pillar it's an obligation but if you're not praying your fast is still valid right inshallah but the reward level Different question and the sin level for not praying, different conversation. So if there are any questions, put them in the chat to me. And then when we come to question time, I'm going to get on with that, inshallah. But what I'm going to do now, I'm going to hand over to Elif. Inshallah, she's going to quickly crash course, run through the spirituality. And I have been answering the questions that have been coming in. So let me just jump out the way, inshallah. Bismillah. Okay, you did? Yeah. So just click when you want to go, right? Yep. Yes, Hope you're well. I'm just very blessed to be here with everyone. It's strange times that we're in. This one? Yeah. So I think I've actually got the hardest part, honestly, because um, uh, spirituality, how do you even like begin with that? I'm going to be speaking quite fast, so um, inshallah, try and, try and keep with me. Um, a lot of stuff is on the slides, as Kay mentioned. Um, we're not intending to go over everything, but it's there for you. Your questions that you sent, um, they very much have influenced what we put on there. So we've tried to do our best there. Feel free to come back to us with any other questions that you may have. Um, so let's begin. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allahumma salli ala sallim. Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim. Tibduqulubu wa duwaiha. Okay, so as we know, um, intentions, intentions, intentions. The intentions that we have are fundamental and our acts and our actions are judged by the intention. So we're going to start, inshallah, by looking at or thinking about intention. Now, in the old days, back in the day, people would sometimes take six months prior to Ramadan to get, get ready and to get um, prepared. Six months. We've got just like slightly over two weeks. Alhamdulillah, it's all good. At least we've got that. And alhamdulillah that we're, inshallah, we hope, that we actually might meet Ramadan. You've got uh, like 120,000 people in our country that haven't made it and Allah have mercy on them. Mm -hmm. And on all, our, all our, our loved ones as well that have passed away, whether it be from COVID or anything else. So we really intend, inshallah, to reach it. This was the prayer of the Prophet Sassan. So intentions, some ideas of intentions that we could or should have. So being in the state that Allah and his messenger love for us to be in, okay? Part of our intentions that they are, I'm not reading through it all, but it's there for you to, to have a scan of um, is to connect with the Quran. This is the month of the Quran and to connect with that and wanting to act in accordance with that. That's going to be pretty, pretty strong. And also Kay has gone through like the basics of fasting. We can call that ordinary fasting, but actually there are different levels. Imam Ghazali talks about three levels of fasting. And one of our intentions could be that we want to intend to do the fast of the 
the people who are the elite. All right. And this is a type of fasting where we don't allow our eyes, our ears, our hands, our legs to disobey God. So we are careful and vigilant over our bodily parts, not just eating and drinking and not having marital relations, but also making sure our eyes don't see what it should, what they shouldn't see, or our ears don't hear what they shouldn't hear, or our, we don't say something that we shouldn't say, okay? Or we don't write or type, you know, type or post something that we shouldn't. And even more than that, a higher level. That's the beauty of our religion. There's, it's for everybody, whatever level that they are, high, low, doesn't matter, it's for everyone that the highest level of fasting is that we go through our fasting day with our heart, mind, just focused on, on its Lord, on Allah. Okay, and that's hard to do. <laughs> that's really hard to do. But inshallah, it's there. So intend. intend. Um, one of the, the questions, or a couple of questions asked about the virtues of Ramadan. Again, shortens, keeping it short and sweet. This is the master of the months, all right? This is the best month, most important month of the year, okay? And inshallah, it's around the corner. And even if we didn't know anything more about this month, just to know that this is the month in which the Quran was revealed, okay? So that is fundamental. This is the month that Allah, our Lord, decided he was going to reveal the Quran to his prophets or something. And we know that the first verse, or inshallah, we hope, hopefully we know, the first verse to be revealed was, which means read in the name of your Lord who created. And even if we knew nothing else, that alone would probably carry us. Because also we're students and we're people in education, right? We're going to be doing a lot of reading, whether it's for exams or studies or Quran, whatever it is, but to do it, bismi rabbi in the name of your Lord and whatever we do in the name of our Lord just to inspire if we need more inspiration this is the month in which the gates of heaven are opened and the gates to hell are closed and the devils are chained so what comes through in this month is very much our own self we can't say oh, I like a bad influence no 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 it's from ourself so we have an opportunity to really get to know our own selves and as the first hadith mentions, the, the one who observes fast during the month of Ramadan out of sincere faith and hoping for Allah's reward, then all of his past sins will be forgiven. That is heavy. That's heavy stuff, right? And one of the probably most important virtues, I would say, perhaps, of this month is Laylatul Qadr, the night of power. And the Quran says, what will, what will, what will let you know what this, what this night is? Okay, the night that is described as better than a thousand months. Okay, and the one who catches this, inshallah, will be sorted. All right, but by by the way, of course, it can be any night, any night. Some people said first, some people said twenty seventh, some people said odd night, some people said last ten somewhere. But realities, we don't know unless you're on some spiritual level and you can tell. But inshallah, we catch it. And how did it come about? Because the Prophet ﷺ was speaking with his companions about the great people of Bani Israel and how they would worship for like a thousand years. And the companions got sad <laughs> because they, they knew that they're not going to be able to do that. We're not going to live for a thousand years. And Allah, most generous as he is, gifted us this beautiful night. So inshallah, may we all reach it, inshallah, mm. when we all reach it. And the dua there that we, it's encouraged for us to say is Allahumma innaka afu'un to hibbul afu 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 and oh Allah, verily you are the pardoner and you love to pardon, so pardon us. Okay. So spirituality but practicality. The Prophet وسلم, is the most fantastic example of spirituality, but he was someone who's a father, a husband, a leader, uh, a, 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 a human rights activist. All the beautiful pro professions were his really. And all those different parts and points, he was with Allah, he was with his Lord. So we need to think carefully about getting organised, all right? And it's, it's not one size fits all, absolutely not. Everyone will start from their different levels, different positions, wherever you are coming from, all good. There's room for everyone, alhamdulillah. But we need to think. There are some questions we need to ask ourselves. You know, when are our heavy college days? When do I work best? Am I going to be praying tarawih? Am I going to be um, getting up for sahur? 
Am I going to stay up after Fajr and do something, studies or Quran or whatever it is? So we need to personally, personally think, how is it going to be? What are my time eaters? What steals my time? Yeah. Are there possible people or things that maybe I should be avoiding this month? That's an individual, very personal thing. But we need to do a bit of that soul, soul searching. And as Al Taf, our dear principal said, and Saida and that Kay have mentioned, support is there. If you're struggling, you're not alone. Just reach out and inshallah it will come. And obviously, uh, the first one we reach out is to is to him. Allahumma iya kana budu ba iya kana steam. Oh Allah, um, you alone we worship, you alone we ask for help. And then we take the practical means, yeah? Get help if you need it. There's a beautiful Ramadan planner. Um, which inshallah will be on source for you to have a look at. It will give you, it, it's useful for ideas and quotes and things like that. Okay, bismillah. So practical steps, good deeds. Uh, look, look, it, yeah. there's no end to it. There's no end to good deeds that one can do. And uh, what might be a nice idea is if you want to tap in the chat to, to Kay, um, ideas of like, your, you know, your own good, good, good ideas of, about um, what good deeds one can do. Yes, it's not all about just doing khatam of Quran because a lot of us cannot manage that. But it's all good, whatever one can, whatever one can. But this is the month of the Quran, okay? So really, there needs to be something in there for that. It can be reading the translation. It could be memorizing one verse. It could be reciting Surah Ikhlas three times every day to try and catch that Laylatul Qadr. Whatever it is, that's our communication with our Lord. That's Him speaking to us. So engaging with that some in some form how that will be is down to us charity the prophet sallallahu was extremely generous especially in ramadan i would say give a pound a day in charity poor students we can't afford it then fine whatever you can do can you share a little bit of your iftar or sahur with the birds outside or the insects one of our dear teachers allah bless him and give him peace um used to say give charity every day even he he would say, our teachers would say, even if it's sugar to ants, okay, even if it's sugar to ants, this is this is a religion which is beautiful, okay. Smile is charity, yeah. Um, can you say some kind words to someone who looks like they're having a hard time? Yeah. Can you help your mum? Yeah. Can you look after? You know. Can you can you keep a bit of company to your older relatives or your neighbour or your your, your little siblings that just want to play, that's charity. You do it with Bismi Rabbi Kaladi. You do it in the name of, of your Lord. That's all beautiful and chari charitable, inshallah. Other ideas are there. Um, being grateful, but as it says there, a general theme really is to, to remember. Whatever you're doing, walking to college, going to bed, eating, drinking, speaking with friends, remember him. Remember him, okay? Um, itikaf, <laughs> we're, on, we're in lockdown. So, okay, we could have a cave here a moment potentially in our own bedrooms at home for an hour. We can make intention for half an hour. We're just going to be in our retreat with our Lord. Yeah. But, um, and also studies, don't forget, don't think that your studies aren't worship. You're students of knowledge, we're students of knowledge. Um, there's a huge rank for that. Don't forget that. You're studying. That's a huge rank. That is worship. Do it. Bismillah. Bismi Rabbi Kaladi Khalak. Prevention of harm. Follow the COVID guidance. Yeah, because part of our religion is about not harming others or causing harm to ourselves. Okay. Bismillah. Some beautiful hadith there to inshallah inspire. Um, I really like the one about prayer. So look, some of us pray. Some of us are just doing one prayer. Some of us are, you know, we're in different places. Wherever you are. Do some small efforts, okay? If you're not praying at all, maybe maybe start one, yeah? Maybe Ramadan is your opening, because this is the month of openings. If you want gifts and you want things to happen that are beautiful to you, this is the month to go to your Lord and ask for that. It's like Ramadan is like a gift. Imagine the most fantastic gift. Anything, everything you ever want is in that gift. You can go running into that gift, open it up. You can go a little bit tentatively, open it up a little bit. Some people might ignore it, crazy, but some people might. But that gift is uh, ours. And whatever you have, your longings, your desires, you go, you take it back to Allah. And he will, he will answer. 
There are so many people who've had massive changes in their lives and their families' lives in Ramadan. And for all the people that are blessed, blessed people that are here today, if every one of us, every one of you, every one of us went back and we had a beautiful, sincere intention, not only would we change ourselves, we could end up changing the whole of our town, our country, this world could be better. If people were sincere and did beautiful things, we, we would make huge, huge impacts, inshallah. Um, so Layla to Qadr, trying to find that. Bismillah. Ah, oh, for balance. Oh, yeah. Okay, so just, it's all good, yeah, but also to be careful as well. Because we've got beautiful hadith still, but there are warnings that say whoever does not abandon lies, okay? Um, Allah doesn't place any value upon his abandoning his food and, and drink. Okay, so don't, we don't want to be liars. And that could be like posting something that we shouldn't be posting or sending a message to someone we shouldn't be. It doesn't need to be verbal. And also you've got the hadith of the two women that were backbiting in Ramadan and when the Prophet told them to be sick, they actually were sick and like horrible flesh and stuff like came, that, that, like that came up, even though they hadn't eaten a thing. But their spiritual state had affected their physical. All right. So Allah protect us from all of that. Allah protect us. Quick summary. <laughs> nice visual there. The, the, the music one, uh, the music one, well, um, there's difference of opinion there, but just to look the thing there. Okay, so lastly then to finish off, I said it would be quick. <laughs> this beautiful verse from Surah Baqarah. Our Lord tells us the following. Allah says, and when my servants ask you of me, Allah speaking, indeed, I am near. I respond to the prayer of, this, of the one who asks when he calls upon me. So guys, let us call on. Okay, this is the month of calling. He's told us what he'll do. He will respond. Okay, we just need to take those baby steps, small steps, little things are loved by our Lord because our Lord is Akram. He's generous. He's generous. So may this Ramadan be a beautiful one. We're here to help you, inshallah. We're here to support you. Let's keep everyone in, in du'as as well. That's heavy, inshallah. And uh, thank you for your time and forgive me for uh, uh, any, any, any gaps and so forth, inshallah. Okay. Any questions? Uh, I'm not. I've been rapid firing, so no. Okay. So okay. hang on, let me clarify. Okay, okay. okay. I, I do want to clarify that we understand that's rushed. Uh, I've been doing rapid fire questions on the chat myself people have been messaging me i've been answering them very quickly i do want to stress uh, uh dr monja ahmed he is here now i believe so after his session inshallah we're happy to um go into a bit more detail about the practical advice and a bit more guidance that we have inshallah for you but i'd like to hand back to al taf inshallah to introduce our guest so bismillah Okay, thank you, and Aldi, thank you. Uh, I really appreciate and really learned a lot from that. So thank you for your time. I'm not going to spend a lot of time because I think you all want to listen to Dr. Ahmed. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce to all of you an alumnus, an ex-student of ours. He came to this college, also went to Denby, is now moved on, is actually a, a, a very well established and well reputable doctor. And we are very, very pleased to have him join us. So without further ado, over to you, Dr. Ahmed, and thank you. Assalamu alaikum guys, thank you for having me today. It's uh, honestly a, a great privilege to be um, working with Luton Sixth Form College. As Altaf mentioned, I was a student there after going to Denby High School and um, I was contacted by the college to just try and talk to some of the students and answer some questions that you might have about Ramadan and how do we keep safe during Ramadan, especially given the context of um, COVID and the global pandemic that we are in at the moment. So I think there's two things that I really wanted to touch on. Number one is keeping safe and taking the benefits from fasting without actually um, putting ourselves in harm's way, which is very important. And the second thing I would probably want to talk about is the background and the context that we're in, which is uh, COVID-19 and how we can protect ourselves and also, and more importantly, our elderly relatives um, during this difficult time. So I, I haven't really prepared a talk per se, because because I was hoping that I would maybe directed a little bit by by you guys really to see what you want to talk about. But I just want to talk a quick a quick bit of background about um, Ramadan. So I'm I'm a GP, so I'm I'm just going to try and touch on some of the uh, medical aspects around fasting. And I think it's very important to understand 
the physiology um, around fasting and the body's physiology around fasting because it does um, kind of guide how we fast in a safe way. So some people ask, is fasting good or bad for your health? And in order to understand that, you really need to look into the physiology of how fasting affects the body. Now, changes occur in the body in response to fasting, and it all depends on the length of the continuous fast. So, for example, Muslims, we fast between um, dawn and dusk hours, and depending on the time of year, that can be anything from 8 to sort of 16, 17 hours, depending on, on the time of year. So there's quite a, a variation there. I remember when I was at sixth form, um, we would um, do Fajr at about 6.30, and then we could have Iftar about 4 o'clock or 4.30. It was amazing. It was really good, actually, because the, 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 the fast wasn't too long, and we still had a lot of evening left behind. We're at a time now where I believe this year the, the Sahur time is going to be quite early for everyone. So everybody will be waking up to have a the pre-dawn meal and, and pray Fajr. And there may be some time left after that to go back to sleep. And I'll touch back on that later. And then we won't be again eating and um, having iftar until later on in the evening around 8 o'clock. So it's quite a long day to be fasting, especially when you're studying and trying to stay alert and concentrate on your studies. Um, and also impending exams as well. So it's, it's it's quite a stressful time for you guys, the students, and also the faculty who are who are also like you know all of us. We're all trying to fast and do the best we can. They have a pressure on them in terms of delivering effective lessons to their students through a global pandemic with all the changes that have happened. So we have to also take some time to think about the staff as well. It's about everyone keeping safe. So going back to the physiology, and I won't bore you guys too much. Um, during during a fast, okay, um, the body the body stores of glucose are used up to provide energy to keep you going. And as the fast gets longer, once those glucose stores run out, fat becomes the next source of energy for your body. Um, only if you fast for a very very prolonged period of time, which is um, we're talking days. OK, you start breaking down proteins for energy and that stage of fasting becomes essentially starvation. And for Muslims during the month of Ramadan, we don't fast to that extent where we're fasting for days and days at a time. So we shouldn't be breaking into our, uh, our protein stores and effectively starving ourselves. That's not really the point of fasting itself. Sometimes people do end up doing that and it's because they're not really taking the right meals that they should be because if you're not taking the right meals and eating the right things you you're actually putting your body in slightly harm's way especially with the sleep deprivation that comes sort of around fasting as well so going back to what i was saying um fat sources are generally where we use up uh, the, the source that we use up during um ramadan so in essence a lot of people do end up losing weight during ramadan and actually, that's not such a bad thing. Um, the trouble is some people lose excess amounts of weight during Ramadan, which is not good. It means you're not taking the right foods during your meals. And some people end up putting on weight during Ramadan, which again isn't good because it means that you're probably not eating the right foods at all. Or you are you come to a third time, mom's put out some samosas and you go a bit crazy. Everyone does it, but that in itself has some health implications, which I'll touch on later. What's very important during uh, the fast, especially for your pre-dawn meal, is trying to take on as many sort of slow release carbohydrates as you can. Because these type of foods, they release energy to your body slowly through the day. And that's very important. This is something that people often overlook. So for example, during the during the pre-dawn meal, we should try and focus on complex carbohydrates. Things like grains, seeds, wheat, um, semolina, lentils, wholemeal flour, basmati rice. What I used to do when I was younger was I would eat rice and curry because we all did that. And as I've got older, when I'm fasting, I tend to wake up and have a bowl of porridge. It's not the most exciting meal for me, but actually I found with a bowl of porridge early in the morning, that keeps me going through the day. And that's really important. And the other thing you have to understand is you often lose a lot of salts, electrolytes, 
um, during the day when you're fasting. And so it's very important to keep yourself very, very well hydrated. As you know, during Ramadan, we can't eat or drink. And that lack of fluid, especially in the summer months, can cause significant dehydration, especially in people who don't focus on their diet so much. I know when I was younger, I wouldn't really look at how much fluid I'm taking or what foods I'm eating because you don't. Because when you're young, you think you're invincible, as we often do. And as you get older and your body starts to creak and uh, make odd noises that it didn't used to make before, you start realizing that actually it's really important to try and focus on, on good foods. And Kay, sorry, uh, interrupt me at any point. I'm just going to keep talking until you stop me. Um, so in terms of healthy foods, I've mentioned the, the whole grains. Sorry, Dr. Um, Ahmed, can, can you see the chat? Because I'm putting questions in the chat that students are giving me. Should I bring up the chat? Can you see it? Yeah. Okay, let me see if I can see it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so I'm okay. just going to let, let me just quickly hit some of the potential uh, health complications around fasting, and then we'll go through some of the questions. Uh, a very key thing that often, often people struggle with is indigestion and heartburn. And it's because we're eating too much in one go. So it's very important, again, especially for the night meal, to eat a little bit slowly and allow it to digest because you're suddenly hitting your digestive system, which has been craving food all day with a huge meal, and that won't help. Um, in terms of medical conditions, one of the big ones is diabetes. So anybody who is diabetic, it doesn't preclude you from fasting, but you need to be very care wary about your blood sugars during Ramadan, and your GP will be able to help you with that, and I'll also mention that. Dehydration I've already touched on, very important and very dangerous medical condition if left untreated for the period of days and weeks, which can happen. And headaches are a common uh, symptom in Ramadan because generally people are poorly hydrated. So it's very important to avoid these things because if you can imagine you've got an exam coming up, you're not sleeping well, you're not eating well, you're not drinking well, you're fasting and you've got a headache, you're not going to be very productive. So it's very important to actually try and keep your hydration up other things include constipation, which, you know, it's, it's a bit yucky to talk about. But really, if we don't eat properly and we don't have good fiber in our diets, we'll get constipated. And that can make you feel bloated and ruin the experience of fasting. This can add to stress and stress is, you know, we've all got stress in our lives, especially with this pandemic and what's going on, especially with exams. So we need to be very wary about managing that stress level. And the other thing is obviously sleep deprivation. Now, sleep deprivation is very difficult to get around because, unfortunately, you know, we, 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 we do lose sleep during Ramadan. This is just part and parcel of, of what Ramadan entails. You can do it safely. It's just being very regimented in how you go to sleep after your evening prayers, um, after iftar and taraweeh. It's important to get to bed on time if you want to wake up and feel refreshed for suhoor. Some people go back to sleep after suhoor. Some people don't. It's just about getting enough sleep and as much sleep as you can. It's, it's, it, it's a difficult time. But really, you don't want to let your education suffer during Ramadan. You've all worked so hard, especially through this pandemic, to sort of address, you know, your, your academic needs. And some of you are hopefully going on to university soon. You don't want that all to fall behind because you've just spent a month um, fasting and, and putting your body, body through difficulty when actually it's a really a spiritual time, a very enriching time. But, you know, if we don't do it properly, then, then that's when you can really suffer and then and then your body will struggle. I'm just trying to get on this chat so I can try and see what everybody's asking. One second. How do I get on this chat? Sorry, Kay, I can't see this chat. That's okay. Do you want me to read them out one at a time? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Okay, hang on. So uh, I'm getting spammed here. This is turning into like a proper uh, GP session, mashallah. Uh, so I'll go from the top, first order to bottom order, what people have been saying. Some of it, mashallah, have covered already. Um, so what are the best foods to eat for suhoor? You've given some, some guidance. Can you be a bit more specific in that regard for what our kids would normally have access to? Yeah, um, so the thing I, I tend to do is um, porridge. Uh, we've all got access to porridge. It's a very easy thing to prepare. It doesn't cost very much money, and it's a very useful food for, 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 for Suhoor time. You need to try and avoid sweet foods, 
sugary, sugary foods, oily foods during suhoor because essentially once you wake up, you eat quickly, you go back to sleep, then your body has to digest that food. So it can lead to indigestion. And also the more important thing is if you haven't taken on complex carbohydrates, then what will happen is you'll start feeling hungry very quickly. And the idea is you don't want to start feeling hungry till the end of the day. You'll be hungry anyway, but the point is you don't want to get hungry too quickly. So the, the foods that I mentioned, um, grains and seeds, um, barley, wheat, oats, so again, porridge, rolled oats is another good one. Um, lentils are quite good, as in dal, that's quite useful. And actually basmati rice in moderation is actually quite a useful food to have. Growing up, what we'd always do in Bengali households, we, we'd have something called um, amdud. So basically it's rice mixed with mango and milk or cream, quite fatty, but also quite rich in complex carbohydrates. And I didn't realize at the time, but it used to get me through the day. And, and there was a reason behind it. I thought it was just a sweet treat. But actually, a bit of mango mixed with a bit of basmati rice and some um, single cream, not ideal, but it's, it's, it's better than having, you know, a takeaway, for example, or, or chicken and chips. Not that you can get that at four in the morning, but you never know. So really, slow release complex carbs. Um, my advice would be probably porridge. That's the best thing that I find. Okay, thank you. Now, some people have asked you for ideas, and I want to highlight to everyone that we're giving you a book written by the medical professionals uh, for meal plans. And the book can, contains loads of recipes for you to look at for iftar and suhoor, which have science behind them. So, inshallah, we're sharing that book with you all. Meal, because I don't want Dr. Ahmed to sit here and give us recipes after recipes after recipes. Mashallah, he probably, but you know, this isn't a culinary moment. Um, so, is it better to have suhoor or skip suhoor and sleep longer if we have early starts? Very difficult question. I mean, really, it's hard not to answer this question without going into the religious aspects a little bit. So, so really, in Ramadan, what we want to try and do is try and be the best Muslims that we can be. And part of our faith and again, I, I'm trying to separate the medical side from the religious side because I'm not here to give religious advice per se, but I'll just talk about my own experience. During Ramadan, and many of you will be able to relate to this, we just try to be the best, best Muslims that we can be because I think it enriches us for the year ahead. And one of the things that's very important to Muslims is praying five times a day. And so you'll find during Ramadan, the masjids are full of people because everybody's just got that extra enthusiasm to pray. So praying, um, praying is very important for Muslims and especially during Ramadan. And praying on time as well is actually really important. So, so, so the way I've always done it is I, I, sleeping through is one thing, but then you end up missing Fajr. So it's, it's just that balance of where you want your priorities to lie. I tend to feel as though if I wake up just before Fajr, I can have a meal, wait for Fajr, pray, and then maybe get an hour and a half sleep afterwards. I know lots of people that will miss Sahur and then sleep through so they get enough sleep. And sleep deprivation is hard to manage. The problem with missing Sahur is what happens is then you end up having a very prolonged fasting state in your body. And as I mentioned before, if your last meal is at midnight, and then you're fasting all the way through till 9 p.m. the next day, okay? That's a very long fast. So that's sort of 12 plus the nine on top. That's a very long fast. And by that time, your body will, will, will switch to using protein stores for energy. And that is essentially called starvation. And Ramadan is not about starving yourself. That's why I touched quickly on the physiology because it's very important. You shouldn't starve yourself. So if you're fasting for over 20, 25 hours, you'll start not 25 hours, 20 hours, you'll start really um, starving your body and your body switches to uh, proteins for energy and that the breakdown of proteins can affect your body adversely quite significantly actually, especially if you do that for 30 days in a row. So if you ask me, I would I would say do not miss your, your pre-dawn meal. It's really important and there's a reason why it's pre-dawn and not longer than that because you don't want to start starving your body. In the stricter sense, we think if we don't eat, we're starving. We always say, I'm starving. But in terms of the physiological aspects of the of the body, starvation is when we start using proteins for energy. First, we use glucose, then we use fat, then we use protein. We don't want to get to that protein stage. So we need enough energy in our body to not allow our body to switch into starvation mode. So don't miss your early, your pre-dawn meal. 
Okay, thank you. A big question which we received beforehand and we need to put forward. So this lack of eating properly, sleeping properly, if somebody's not following the advice that you've been mentioning, uh, and they're going through that starvation state, sleep deprivation state, what could be the consequences of that in a COVID environment? So I think, you know, if you don't fast properly and safely, which is why I think we keep drumming on about this whole idea about the meals and safety, you leave your body in a weakened state, okay? As anybody knows before, if you've ever been a bit run down and then you end up getting a cold, that cold lasts for longer than it should. Or if you end up getting tonsillitis, the tonsillitis lasts longer than it should. Because in order for the body to mount a good immune response, you need to be well nourished, well hydrated. That's why when people are in hospitals and they're unwell, they often get IV fluids because it boosts their hydration status, allows them to recover quicker from any illness. So I've mentioned before, you know, the, the risk that COVID poses, uh, the, the, the severe aspects of COVID, to the population of the college, maybe not so much for the faculty, but definitely for the students, is quite low. But actually, if you're malnourished, dehydrated, sleep deprived, and then you end up getting COVID, you're going to suffer from it more than you should have. And it can have significant implications. We have lots of patients who have suffered from long COVID, which is the symptoms and syndromes that exist post having COVID. And they can be quite debilitating. Luckily, young people have, have a strong physiology in general, barring the ones that have significant medical issues, which is a separate issue. But anybody who's in that deprived, starved state, any insult to the body can cause significant harm, regardless of COVID or otherwise. But in the fact that we're in a global pandemic, it's so much more important for you to try and get the right sleep, get the right meals, get the right hydration and get the right rest. <laughs> Okay. okay. Yeah, that's very important. Now, somebody's asking um, sleep schedules. Is there anything you can advise on a sleep schedule for someone fasting from uh, 8 p.m. to 4 a.m.? Is when they're bismillah, if, if you can advise on that. I, I think sleep is a, a big issue in Ramadan. It is for all of us, and we can't get away from that, especially because we want to spend some as much of our time as we can praying and remembering God during our prayers and our activities. I think it's very important to have a very strict sh schedule around your sleep. And that's important actually, even outside of fasting, especially as you're growing up, it's very important to get the right amount of sleep. Now, obviously in Ramadan, you might not get the right amount of sleep depending on how much you do, but it's very important to take those opportunities. Now it's difficult for some people because some people naturally go to sleep at 1 a.m. It does happen. Um, which is not safe in its own anyway, in its own right. In Ramadan, people go to the mosque in the evenings, especially the the the, the males. They often don't get home till midnight, and then it's very difficult to then just switch off and go to sleep. Not everybody can do that. Some people can, but a lot of people struggle to just go off to sleep. I think sleep hygiene is more important than sleep scheduling. And what sleep hygiene, and it's worth looking this up, guys, if you have it, and girls, if you have a chance, sleep hygiene just gives you tips on how to manage your sleep environment in order for you to get the adequate amount of sleep and get off to sleep. So simple things like staying off your phones after a certain time of the day, staying off the laptops, avoiding caffeine late in the day after, say, 6 or 7 p.m., um, switching off all of your instruments, having a darkened room, these simple things make a huge difference. I remember when I was at college and at university, because um, obviously I went off to do medicine, I was staying up till two, three in the morning and because you just do when you're young and it catches up with your body. And as I've got older, I've implemented some sleep hygiene routines into my day, i.e. I don't have a TV in my bedroom. I never have. I used to, but not anymore because it's just a distraction from sleep. I don't use my phone after a certain amount of time because again, it distracts you from your sleep. And if that period you think you're on your phone playing a game or texting your friends lasts an hour, you've had exposure to light in your eyes in a darkened room, it's much harder than for your body to go off to sleep. So there's another delay then, so you don't end up going to sleep till two, and then you have to be up again at four. So you can see how over the period of 30 days, this can really catch up with you and weaken your body. Very important, not necessarily to sleep schedule, but to implement sleep hygiene routines within your life. And this is not just for Ramadan, this is all the time. 
Okay, thank you. So a uh, few people are asking, um, what's the best way to stay hydrated while fasting? So is there a schedule of drink this much, make sure you drink this amount at this time? So I think the key thing is, um, is, is when you're allowed to drink, just drink. So I was in, I was in Umrah during Ramadan two years ago in Mecca, where it was really hot. So as soon as iftar came and that short time between iftar and sahur with the prayers we were told by our 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 scholar that was with us just drink 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 don't worry about anything else you need to keep hydrated now we're not in such a hot country now but hydration status is very important for your concentration for your physiology for your ability to fast and for your ability to study because i understand you guys might have some exams coming up so what i would do is at least two liters for most people is enough if not do more and it's worth just if, if it's at home just understand what is two liters in your mind because that really helps you kind of grasp how much fluids you need the other useful thing is fruit and vegetables because not only are they high in fiber which helps your digestion but they're high in fruit you may find in some households there's lots of melons cut up during iftar time there's a reason behind that because fruits like melon they're predominantly water with a nice taste to them but that hydration you're getting at iftar time gives your body a bit of a boost and what you have to remember is you drink your glass of water and you have your fruit at iftar through the evening and into the into the morning if you are going to snack it's better to just drink water because that hydration you'll need that to carry you through to the next day until the next iftar so hydration is really important actually temperatures are picking up now and when we're in ramadan we're probably going to have some really hot days if you really want to uh, optimize your ability to enjoy the fast, and this is important, fasting is there for us to enjoy and really benefit from. You can't really benefit and enjoy something if you're just kind of lethargic and flat. And that's part of Ramadan, you will be tired, but you should feel enriched. And water is honestly, is the best medicine. Are there any fruits that you recommend? I said melons. Melons is really good. Oranges are very good. Um, so like I said, when I was in Umrah two years ago, we used to take oranges in our bags and if that I would cut them up and have a bit of juice and orange. So anything that's high in water content is very useful during Ramadan. Okay, so I'm going to give some, uh, Dr. Amr, if you don't mind, I'm going to just chuck a couple of questions at you rapid fire, which I hope hopefully not too complex. Um, so should foods be of a li liquid consistency? How do we prevent bloating? Are there any vitamins or supplements we should be taking while fasting? So if you can do those three, then I'll, there's another couple I'll chuck. Up. So I don't think food should, there's no need to liquefy your foods at all. There's a misconception that says, oh yeah, liquefied foods are easier to digest. They are, if you're 75 and frail. Um, but if you're young and healthy, like I'm hoping most of you are, there's no need to liquefy, liquefy your foods, actually. We don't want to put your digestive system to sleep. Because if you put your digestive system to sleep with liquefied foods and then if third time you have a massive meal, um, your digestive system is going to struggle. Remember, this is not a starvation period. This is a fasting period. There's a significant difference. Bloating is often caused by foods that are poorly di digested. So like I mentioned, you know, a lot of people get bloating and also acid reflux during Ramadan. It's because they're having quite greasy foods, oily foods. These are harder to digest, especially when you're fasting. So try and have things that are much cleaner. Fruits are very good things. Whole grains, as I mentioned, very useful, in, uh, very useful food to have during Ramadan. Um, you should need to avoid things like deep fried things, curries with excessive oil. Grilling food is better than um, than, than oily food. Um, high sugar content, for example, the rasgullas and the gulab jamun, Indian sweets. The high fat cooked foods like pratas, uh, especially greasy pastries. Switching to things that are more sort of milk-based sweets like Ras Malai, uh, yogurts, um, baked samosas rather than fried samosas, boiled dumplings, grilled meat, grilled chicken. These are much easier to digest. You can fry, but shallow frying, I'd say, is probably more recommended. And there's the, a lot of people have got air fryers now, and a lot of people use the air fryers. They're much better to use than a deep fried pastry because it's just harder to digest. And these are what leads to bloating. Another reason that people get bloated is because they get constipated during Ramadan. So foods that are high in fiber. And the way I, I, I remember it is anything that's green generally has a lot of fiber in it. 
So uh, fiber rich foods will allow your digestion to keep going and you don't get constipated. And that again will limit the amount of bloating that you have. Sorry, okay, what was that last question? Okay. Vitamins, supplements. Uh, multivitamins are useful, but actually if you have a good balanced diet throughout Ramadan with the right amount of fruit and vegetables, you get all the all the balanced vitamins that you need. Okay, so I think the last three big ones that I see here are unless they come trickling in now. Uh, a lot of people have asked about exercise while fasting, like if they should and when they should and how they should. Somebody's asked about when's the best time to revise. And then I've got here, you mentioned some concerns about staff instead of students. What would they be for, for you? And thankfully, alhamdulillah, we have the director of HR here as well with us. So, best of So, exercise, um, I think exercise is always a healthy thing to do. It's just about timing the exercises. Um, I know a lot of people um, have taken up running over the last year during the pandemic. And I know a lot of friends of mine who run a running club who go for light runs, not heavy runs, light runs before iftar. Because, you know, when you exercise, you're putting your body through excess strain. And, and the reason we do that is because to try and build up our bodies and strengthen our bodies. Ramadan is not necessarily the, the time to do that. But also, you know, it's important to keep your body healthy and keeping your body uh, moving is, is very useful. Going for walks before iftar is a very useful thing. It's not too strenuous on the body. It keeps the joints moving. It keeps you a bit supple, but it's not too heavy on the body. And even a light run is okay because you know that you'll be hydrating straight after. What you don't want to do is go for a run after iftar because I think you'll struggle. You'll be full and your belly will be bloated. Not the right time to go. Revision, very difficult. Again, sometimes it's quite easy. What I used to find useful was revising before iftar because you have that window from when you get home about 4.30 to when you eat, where, where you know the food is coming, so your brain is telling you, okay, the food's coming soon, food's coming soon, uh, I'm thirsty, but the water's coming soon, now's a good time to try and revise. Another useful time to revise, and this is down to the individual, is some people after uh, sahur, they don't go back to sleep. It's individual to every, every, uh, every person. But after sahur, you've just had something to eat, you've just had a glass of water, and you just prayed Fajr, you might have an hour and a half before you have to get back up again. I find very t productive time. Your body is well hydrated, well nourished. Uh, you're, you're fully awake because you've been awake for a while, you've had a meal and you've prayed, and you feel spiritually enriched because you've just prayed Fajr, which a lot of us don't do except for in Ramadan, if I'm absolutely honest. So that's, a, you know, that's when you're feeling really tip-top, really good time to revise. Um, and the last one was staff. So, yeah, you know, we're talking about the safety of students during Ramadan. Um, the students aren't the only people that may be fasting. Our staff are fasting as well. And they have families at home. And they often, in many respects, have a lot more responsibilities at work and at home than some of the students do. So they may be responsible for their own children who they have to look after and prepare meals for and ensure that they're safe during Ramadan. They also have to prepare meals for, uh, prepare um, lessons for the students, deliver those lessons for the students, which involves a lot of talking to the students, which can make them feel a lot more um, tired, lethargic. So it's very important, if not more important actually for the faculty to make sure that they engage in Ramadan in a very safe way. You know, we're all human beings, despite what we're doing, we all need to be safe during fasting. So I think it's so important that our our faculty um, look at some of these issues. Sometimes when you're older, you think, oh, yeah, I know that, I know that. But actually fasting safely and fasting properly and fasting to benefit your body and your mind and your soul, it's relevant to all of us, whether you're 14 or 45, it doesn't matter. And we all, somehow, we all sometimes ignore our bodies during Ramadan. I think it's more important, if anything, for the faculty to really listen to their bodies during Ramadan and not to overexert themselves. Otherwise, you, you won't benefit and you, you end up putting your, your body in harm's way. And don't forget, some of the faculty will be people who are at higher risk of severe complications from COVID. We know that um, COVID uh, has had an adverse effect on BAME communities, and I'm assuming a lot of your faculty are going to be older and also possibly from BAME communities need to be very vigilant and try and take care during Ramadan. Also, just one more question came through and then just something I want to ask you, please. Somebody said something about weightlifting at the gym. Any thoughts on that in Ramadan? <sighs> OK, I know a lot of people that do do it. 
Um, I wouldn't advise it, but I wouldn't, you know, everybody knows their own body. Weightlifting puts a significant strain on the body. Again, it's, it's all to do with timing, okay? A lot of people think, oh, Ramadan, great time to lose some weight and get super fit. That's not really the point of Ramadan. Yes, eat well. If you eat well and fast, you lose weight anyway. If you overexert your body, you'll end up putting your body through strain and passing out. Probably not worth it. You'll end up missing a few fasts as a result. Some people do it. It can be done safely. If you're asking me as a doctor who's talking to Luton Sixth Home College, I would say avoid it. <laughs> Thank you. Lo last thing then, the impact of adhering to COVID guidelines might not be a risk for our students, but what about their parents, their communities and going home and anything else in Ramadan? So I think, uh, let's talk about Luton. So, so Luton has been quite adversely affected by COVID. I've had patients that have died. I've had... Um, family, sort of extended family members who have died. I'm sure there's students out there who have someone who's either directly or indirectly related to them died from COVID. It's been a very traumatic year. It's been a difficult year. One of the issues is, you know, a lot of people, I believe, may have ended up catching COVID when it could have possibly been avoided. We're not really adhering to the social distancing guidance as well as we could. Some of us have been great others a bit loose, others not so good at all. What we don't, what we have to understand, especially for young people is, you're not so much at risk from dying from COVID because you know, the evidence shows that younger people are quite safe. But you know, a lot of your, your, your families, okay, they come from multi-generational households. And a lot of the Asian population, especially 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, there's significant comorbidities, diabetes, ischemic heart disease, um, hypertension, these are all risk, obesity, these are all almost independent risk factors for developing severe complications from COVID. So while we at college, relaxing with our friends and mixing quite freely, one of your friends has symptoms of COVID, they didn't tell anyone, they came to college, they spread it to 10 people, those 10 people go home and spread it to their mothers and their fathers, and ultimately what happens, someone dies, and it's just not worth it. And um, you know you can you can socialize with your friends, but still maintain a distance. And it's been hard, especially for younger people. The social distancing has been really hard because you just can't see your friends, you can't even see your cousins or your even some of your close family that live nearby because of the rules that have been set in place. They seem quite strict, but there's a reason for it. And by by following social distance guidance, and part of that is actually if you've got a cough, if you've got a fever, if you've got a loss of sense of smell. Don't come to college that day because you don't know. Testing is freely available now and you can get the results back really quickly. If you've got any of those symptoms, you need to isolate yourself at home. And if you have, you know, family members who are at risk, make sure they stay away from you until you've got a test done. And actually, it's beneficial to society. And I was saying to Al Taf the other day, I'm really keen for the students because you guys are really the future of Luton and society, if anything. You know, I really want you guys to feel empowered that you're 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 doing things and you understand why you're doing things and making the right decisions for the sake of not only yourselves, your families, but the whole community and anybody who's from the AMU communities or any community actually from Luton. You've seen the real um, tragic effects that COVID has had. So I really just want to push that message again that social distancing, um, hands, face, space, all of these things that you're hearing. They're not just there as a fad. There's a reason why, you know, there's a reason why we have to do it. I saw a patient the other day who, who, who was having problems with breathing, didn't think anything of it, called me, came into my surgery, had COVID, but hadn't tested because he thought I won't test. 50-year-old diabetic chap, his oxygen levels was about 72%. And, you know, the normal is about above 92%. 72%, I sent him to hospital, he's dead, okay? And that's not a one-off. It's happening every single day, okay? I don't think any of our students are significantly in harm's way, but your dads, your granddads, your grandmas, they're in harm's way. And what I don't want is for, you know, one of us, any of us, to be in a situation where, because we had a social gathering with our friends and had a good time, one of us took COVID home. And as a result, our mom or our dad or our granddad's dead. It's not worth it. It's heartbreaking for an entire community. And, and, and the faculty and the, and, the, and the students in college, you guys are old enough to understand these implications, which is why I'm not really sugarcoating this. I'm being quite honest. 
this is the reality. People are dying every day. It's getting better with the vaccine. Uh, and actually, I'm going to touch on that, Kay, just to your students, because you, you guys are all young adults, and 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 we have to respect that you guys are young adults and you're 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 ready to take on the world. Lots of people in Luton, especially high risk people, they're not taking the vaccine. And the evidence has shown the reason they're not taking the vaccine is not because they're saying no. It's not the 80 year olds saying no. It's their children that are saying, oh, I'm not sure, you know, what if this, what if that. As far as I've seen, it's safe. And actually, the evidence from Public Health England is it's saving lives. So if you have parents or grandparents who have declined the vaccine despite being offered, talk to them. It's not about forcing people to have a vaccine or not. It's about talking, engaging, communicating, find out what are their fears, what are their concerns. Tell them, go and speak to the doctors. There's so much advice out there. And if we don't, you know, some of these people are dying unnecessarily because they've just not taken the vaccine that was available. It doesn't make sense to me, but it's not our it's not our place to judge. It's our place to get that communication going. And the students here, especially, you guys are the future. You guys are young adults who are going to take on the world very soon and, you know, explore what else the world has to offer. I feel as though there's a responsibility for you guys to step forward and say to your parents, why do you take the vaccine? Why not? Explain to me. Let's try and understand what the barriers are for people taking vaccines and people following these guidance so we can address them. Because ultimately, if we don't address them, people die. And I really don't want people to die. Okay, Sorry, that was a bit harsh. No, no, no. Do you, so would you say then it's more important in Ramadan for the social distancing for the parents, the grandparents, the aunties, the uncles? Absolutely. Everybody will be fasting. So everybody's uh, body may be in a weakened state, especially if not, they're not fasting in the appropriate ways. We have elders that fast despite the fact that they probably shouldn't fast because they're frail or they're diabetic or they're on certain tablets. But they, because of their, their, their real enthusiasm towards fasting, they do it. So they're putting themselves at risk. And by us going and mixing with other people and then exposing ourselves to them, we're putting them at risk. So it's a, it's a real collective effort that we need to engage in. Okay, Zakhar. From from what I understand, I think we've covered all the questions. I think uh, Allah bless you, Dr. Ahmed. That was so uh, refreshing and help and helpful. And inshallah, it will help a lot of our community. Um, so bless you for coming and taking the time to do that. Is, is uh, uh, before I hand over to Altaf again? Uh, sorry, is there something you want to say, Dr. Ahmed? No? no. No, no. I just thank you for having me. It's, it's been a pleasure, honestly. Uh, before I hand over to Altaf again, I do want to remind people that we did schedule it till 10 past five, but Elif and I, we're happy to hang back and to go through some of the other stuff in a bit more detail, whether that's practical guidance or clarification on some of the Islamic advice or everything else. And I want to just really emphasize what Dr. Ahmed said from an Islamic point of view. You are in a really fortunate position because you want to worship Allah and worshiping Allah includes prevention of harm. So the Muslim is one whose neighbor is free from harm from their tongue and actions. And when we abide by COVID rules, Alhamdulillah, like look at this SubhanAllah, with the right intention, we are worshipping Allah because this is the command of the Prophet, peace be upon him. So those hands face space, keeping our distance, doing all of that is the intention for prevention of harm. And that is because we are taught that in this religion. So inshallah, we can emphasize that. So I'll, I'll pass back over to Altaf uh, to... Uh, thank our guest and, and close and we're here afterwards inshallah yeah just to close uh, dr ahmed remarkable i think you know don't be apologizing for saying the right thing and doing the right thing and it's that it gives me a lot of pride that you're next student of ours and you are just connecting with us so I appreciate your time, you know, and also can I just say on behalf of our kind of audience, the stuff that you've been doing over the last year, et cetera, is remarkable, you know, in terms of those unsung heroes and what you've seen and what you've had to deal with. So thank you very, very much for your advice and your guidance. And to the rest of the audience, you know, you are leaders, you know, Dr. Hamid is absolutely right. You are the future leaders, the future doctors. I've kind of bored people by saying that the future prime minister will come from this college. One of you might be the future prime minister. So this is leadership over the next, well, that's what you've shown over the last 12 months. This is what you will show over the next few days, next few months, and especially in Ramzan. And yes, your job is to influence and cajole. Everyone has that wise auntie. I have the wise auntie who thinks she knows everything but doesn't know much. Our job is to have to communicate in the right way. So we are doing the right thing. So thank you, everybody, for your time. And, you know, have a blessed Ramzan, have a good break. You deserve it. 
spend some good time with the family and you know it's an exciting month i'm looking forward to ramzan it's a, a brilliant time of the year so thank you everybody and thank you alif and Kay. you have been really remarkable i learned a lot from just listening to you and i don't think i've ever heard Ali speak that quickly ever before so well done Kay. i don't know how you did that but well done back to you unless you want to have some any final words Kay. Uh, dr ahmed allah bless you thank you so much we'll be in take touch care. guys thank you. Take be care. safe thank you sir. Bye -bye. everyone everyone else you're welcome to leave if anybody who does what wish to stay elif and i are here to go through more questions in a bit more detail and everything else but altaf allah bless you Saeed, allah bless you thank you so much thank you um, allah bless you take, take care each other so thank you and salam alaikum everyone wa alaikum salam So I'll, I'll wait about 30 seconds or so, and, and then it, whoever's left, if you want to talk, we'll talk, and we'll go into a bit more detail about everything, inshallah. If there's anyone left. Okay, there's some people still here. I think they're desperately trying to press leave, but they're not able to. Oh no, here you go. So, okay, we we forgive us. We were a bit rushed. Um, and before the rest of you disappear, can I please ask, this is on behalf of us and Dr. Ahmed, there's a feedback form for the session and there's some questions in there that Dr. Ahmed actually wanted us to put in. So if you can be so kind when we're done, if you can put that in there, I've put the link for that in the chat. If you can do that, that'd be really appreciative for us um, uh, and for that. Uh, so Huma's asked again, what's the best thing to do for Layla Tulkadar? Inshallah, I'll talk about that now as well. So we're going to continue uh, with where we left off and, and have a, a wider conversation. Uh, any recommendations for Indian translation? So let me go through some rapid fire questions first that came through that I was doing on an individual basis. So the prayer room, people have asked, will the prayer room be open when we come back? Yes, inshallah, it will be. And I will email that out. We'll be back to the system we had before where you would need to book. You would need to bring your own prayer mat. You would need to wear your mask. All of that will apply. The prayer room won't be able to be used as it was a few years ago. So you can't just come there and chill and read Quran and do everything. It'll just be in and out for prayer. The booking system will be back. But that's confirmed, inshallah, day one when we come back. Uh, I'll send all of that out in an email. You'll get the booking, booking links for sisters and brothers. Just go click, click, book, in and out. Inshallah, it's there for you in Ramadan. So that's that's sorted. Uh, I just put the chat uh, link for the feedback. If you can do that again, please, it will help us and it will help Dr. Ahmed. There's some things he wants. Now, um, going back to some practical advice and Layla Tulkadan. So first things first, someone just asked me, what's the best translation of Quran? A lot of people recommend uh, Abdul Halim's translation. It's quite good, Abdul Halim. If you don't have a copy in English, you can go to Quran.com. And, and from there, you can select different translations. Honestly, there is no single translation that's going to be, you know, on point with it. Um, but Abdul Halim is quite good. So Quran.com, you can go there. You can change the settings of the translator. You can find whoever you want. See what goes on with it. But I'm, I'm telling you, none of them are perfect. Right. So just bear that in mind. With regards to Layla Tulkadar, Elif said this. And I'll, I'll hand up back over to her in a minute. Um, so with regards to Layla Tulkadar which is very important for Muslims. And Elif did mention, and I just wanted to reiterate this, we're not 100% sure when that is. People say 27th, people say last 10 odd nights, uh, whatever. The advice from some of our teachers is the following, act like it's every day, right? Act like it's every day, because if we take 30 days and behave every day like it's Laylat al-Qadr, then inshallah we'll catch it. OK, the last 10, maybe you act like it is a bit more. So Elif mentioned giving a pound a day charity. That might be too much for you or you might not know how to do that. So even if you wanted to give charity on a monetary basis, what you could do on your way to the shop or on the way to school, you could even like, you know, those little charity boxes that you find in the shop, you could put 10p in there. That's enough. It would be as though you gave charity for a thousand months. In the college, we actually have a charitable partner the Luton and Dunstable Hospital. So we do a lot of fundraising with them and on their behalf. What we will try to do, we'll try and talk. I don't know if it can happen. Uh, we do take donations, but we'll see if we can set that up. 
so that you can be in a position where you can donate while you're at college. Um, so we'll have to see about that, inshallah. Other things you can do in preparation for Laylatul Qadr. Elif mentioned this, but I want to clarify this. So Surah Al-Ikhlas, so Qul Allahu Ahad, Surah number 112, which is a very short Surah. There is hadith to tell us that if you read this three times, you have the reward equivalent of reading the entire Quran. So what is of a bare minimum you can do just on a daily basis to implement with the intention that you catch Laylatul Qadr is to read Surah Ikhlas three times. Because then, inshallah, when you catch Laylatul Qadr, it will be the reward of the Quran multiplied by a thousand months. So look, we're saying tiny basic baby steps at the moment. You could add two extra nafil to your prayer in the evening in the hope that you catch Laylatul Qadr and then you have prayed two extra nafil for a thousand months. So these are all baby things and re-emphasizing what Elif said. Be kind to your parents. Be kind to the people around you, even adhering to social distancing with the intention that, you know, I'm following the commands of Islam. That alone will give you rewards, inshallah, Laylatul Qadr. Um, we can also say, Elif's put it on her slide, but I want to highlight it. Just walking from a place from the college to the other side of the college, instead of going there with your headphones in, with your heavy metal blaring or whatever it is you listen to, just walking from corridor, from northeast down downstairs, just in that moment, if you could just utter in, in your heart, just say, subhanallah or alhamdulillah, or la ilaha illallah, just as you're walking inside your heart, you're getting the constant, constant reward of dhikr and praise and all of that. And inshallah, if that's on Laylatul Qadr, why not? If you don't have a tasbih, like the physical prayer beads, invest in them. Have that in your pocket. Go around and use that wherever you want to. You know, there's evidences for tasbih. There's, there's no issue with it whatsoever. Um, going through any act of goodness. So acts of goodness fall into two ways. Things that we actively do and things that we abstain from. So if we don't sin, you're getting reward for that. Right? That's really important. If you do good works, you're gaining reward for that too. So it's a win-win situation, inshallah. So we just have to be conscious and mindful of what it is that we're doing. So we can continue doing that on a daily basis. When you're at college, what I will suggest as well, which would be important, is that um, you show that extra level of kindness to your teachers whether they're fasting or not fasting, right? Because it is a month of goodness. So we need to do that. And I want to emphasize that, look, as your teachers and members of staff, we are human beings. We have good days, we have bad days, right? We have chaotic lives inside and outside of college. We are human. So overlook our flaws, forgive us for our shortcomings, of which we have many. In Ramadan in particular, because that extra kindness you can show us, Allah is aware of. Now, um, somebody asked, how do you receive the nutrition book? I'm going to email it out to you all who registered. And what I'll also do, um, we, we will put that upload it online so you can have access to it. The R Ramadan planner, I'll tell you where that is. I've already uploaded it, but I'll share with you where that is. And I'll do that, inshallah, when the meeting finishes and, and we're done. Um, how And that's a really good book. You know, our thanks to the authors, like subhanAllah, they charge money for that book. But we went to them and we didn't play the poor card, right? It's the truth. We said, look, it's our kids in Luton. They're not going to be able to pay seven, pay eight pound a pop. What can we do? And bless them. They said, just give it to them for free. So they've given that to us to give to you as a gift for Ramadan so that we, inshallah, can have that discussion with our families and they can be healthy and, and safe in Ramadan as well. Now, before I hand over to Elif, just what I really wanted to say, I, I did some rapid fire um, fiqh questions people were asking me um, so somebody asked about suhoor uh, and, and I want to clarify this somebody asked me do I can I do suhoor at 12 o'clock technically yes you can but you heard what Dr Ahmed said right that could cause starvation issues from an Islamic point of view it's not really an issue if you missed it it's better obviously too because it's a sunnah of the prophet peace be upon him somebody did ask me does do I have to have iftar with a date no you don't 
You don't have to start your iftar with a date. It's not an obligation. It's better to, and there's probably great wisdom in it. It's a practice the Prophet, peace be upon him, himself did. And, and it's a sunnah. It's very nutritious, very good for us. But a lot of the stuff, like, uh, I, I really want to emphasize this. In different parts of our lives, we will have different tests. Right now, you guys are students. You might not be in a year or two, right? Or you might not be in five years from now. Who knows? So the individual test that Allah has given you is that of being a student. So if you divert your energies and your efforts to being a student, this is worship. Like, for example, if you've got an exam in the morning and, you know, your heart says, I want to go Tarawih for two hours, but you know it's better to study. Honestly, if in that situation, if you would have gone to Tarawih, Allah is so merciful that he's told us this in literature, you will gain the reward for the intention that you had, even if you couldn't fulfill that intention. So if you would have gone Tarawih, but you didn't for reasons out of your control, Allah will give you, inshallah, the reward for that anyway. But if you instead focused on your exam, focused on your education, focused on college, that is tremendous in terms of reward. I know it might not feel like worship, but it is. And in Hadith literature, in Tirmidhi, I believe the Prophet, peace be upon him, told us for the one who seeks knowledge, even the fish in the sea asks Allah for forgiveness for them. Right? And you are blessed enough to be in that circumstances now that might change for you later on. So really take advantage of that. You know, you are students, students of knowledge, inshallah, which will benefit you and the people around you. Focus on your education in Ramadan. There's nothing wrong with that. Right? Taraweeh. Be careful. It's a mosque. If mosques are holding it, you know, people go there. Be careful. Social distancing. Be careful. You can pray Taraweeh at home. No issue whatsoever. You can do it at home. And, and I have to stress again, you don't have to do it. It's a good thing to do, but you don't have to do it at all. Right. So depending on, on where you go through, uh, it's just. You know, your situation is right. Is it OK to pray Taraweeh plus 12 at night? Yes, it is. So you can pray Taraweeh all the way up until Fajr if you had to. I would suggest it's better to do it before midnight because I hope you're going to sleep and then waking up. Right, so uh, that's your consideration here. Um, any other rapid fire quick questions for me before I hand over to Elif? Because again, I am conscious that uh, you know, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Rapid fire quick questions, send them to me. A lot of the questions about diet and food and meal planning, inshallah, the nutrition guide will help you on that. You can you know, talk about that to your families. If you have a burning question on anything like uh, does listening to music affect the fasting? Yes and no. Look, if you take the position that music is haram, then the only effect it will have on the fast is the fact that you have engaged in something that is haram. So what does that mean? I, I, you need to be very careful to uh, how I explain this. Allah will not take away your reward. He doesn't say, hello, here's 10 good deeds for you but you did something naughty, let me take away too. That's not how it works. Instead, what you will find is that Allah places no limit on the good that we gain. But if we sin, that limit can be capped, right? So you have to look at it like that. Instead of having a million good deeds that day, because we have done things that uh, we shouldn't have done, Allah may have said, today you're only getting 50 good deeds. So if you take the position that music is haram, Listening to music will not invalidate your fast, right? Your fast is still valid, providing you didn't do the nullifiers that we spoke of. But there's the question of sinning. And sinning, unless it's the stuff that breaks your fast, especially the kafara ones, they're not going to invalidate your fast. They may just cap the level of reward that you can gain in this beautiful, blessed month. And that's if you take the position that music is hard. Uh, and then, uh, you know, that's a whole different cost conversation. What do you even mean by music and yada, yada, yada. That's complicated, technical. Uh, anything else? Should Ramadan be for learning about the religion? Every day should be about learning about the religion, if I'm honest with you. Um, but Ramadan, yes. And that I wanted to say this. So thank you, Subhan. Thank you, Abdul Subhan. This is a very important thing for me to also say to you. We have... Uh, on faith matters, we have a load of resources that you can use. So if you haven't already, there's the weekly Friday reminder that I put up there, which are just short 10 minute sessions. What you could do in Ramadan, you can go and listen to them and write down the verses of the Quran 
and write down the verses, uh, the hadiths that we discuss or the guidance from scholars. Just make a note of them. That in and of itself, you're learning a verse of the Quran, you're learning the hadith, that's learning itself. Also, uh, we've been doing the book of assistance for about seven weeks now. They're all uploaded. So they're about an hour and a half sessions per week. We've been doing that. Inshallah, we'll continue that when we come back from Ramadan. They're in the Faith Matters tile as well. They're longer than 10 minutes, but they're much more detailed. So you can go and click on those and take in the guidance that you hear from that or watch the videos. The PowerPoint has the, has the book displayed. You can do that. So, yes, I would very much encourage learning in Ramadan because in Ramadan, there's the opportunity to gain more good deeds. And Allah, his gates of mercy are open in Ramadan so that learning can have an even greater impact. But Ramadan or no Ramadan, we should be learning anyway. It's obligation on Muslims to learn. And that's that's, you know, here or there. In Ramadan, Allah can make that learning for us a little bit easier. Now, Ramadan itself, remember, it's testing us as a human being and that testing us as a human being is a transformative process all right that's a transformative process when we respond properly we change so you know the usual experience is the first week of ramadan everyone's like a zombie walking around a bit, bit tired by the second week we get it a bit more by the third week we're really in the swing of it by the fourth week we're in it and when it leaves we feel sad all right we have to think why is that why is that now, Imam Ghazali, rahimallah, he mentions that all of the illnesses and diseases of a human being come from their stomach, right? And, and that, that's based on a hadith that's really important. So when we actually control the stomach, we find that spiritually, a lot of other things are going on as well, right? Our anger decreases, our sexual uh, appetite decreases, our awareness of God increases because we don't have all these things to distract us. And one of the best things about Ramadan is that it forces us to be in the remembrance of God. And Allah tells us in Surah Baqarah, remember me and I will remember you. So when we're walking around sad and starving, try and remind ourselves this is because God told me to. And then when we remember him, he remembers us and then remind ourselves that he's remembering us. So by being in this position, there's a spiritual transformation that we don't fully understand or recognize, uh, but it's happening. And that's based on intentions and what we do. So before I hand over to Elif, any other quick question for me? I mean, if you still keep them coming to me, I'll answer them. But I'm just going to hand over to Elif, inshallah, for her to give her final thoughts. And uh, and then we'll, we'll end the session there, inshallah, unless there's something you want to ask. So, Bismillah. Quickly, last few. Can you see? No, I need to move. Otherwise, mm -hmm. she can't. look, I, I, we're not I, breaching I, COVID. We're, we're married, right? So we're not <laughs> breaching COVID guidelines. Sorry, everyone. Only there are some questions. I, I, I think, you know, the, the, the what was said before, is, is probably enough and uh, the slides and stuff to, to revisit if you wish but if there are any particular questions then bismillah send them over or if you look if you want to unmute yourself unmute yourself and, and say it that way if it's easier as well you're brave enough uh, okay sorry i thought one thing i haven't actually mentioned first aid uh, so i'll have to i'll have to deal with that uh, specifically as well but in, look the first aiders are here to help students right and we need to listen to them what they're saying so in college if we're struggling a bit with, with these things, uh, show them some compassion because they they think you're unwell. So if they're saying to you, drink some water, drink some water, you may need to drink water if you're that unwell, right? Remember, you can break your fast for medical reasons. You're not sinful for it. You just have Qadar. The first aid is, it's a really difficult time for them, even in COVID. Um, so please do have consideration for them in Ramadan. Uh, if you're unwell, go home. And you know, see what you can what you can do there to take the pressure off them. Anything else? No. Unless, there are, Unless there's final burning questions, this is what we're planning to do. After the meeting finishes, inshallah, we'll email you the slides. We'll email you the link to the book because it's too big to send in an email. So you just go and download it from source. Um, the link for the video will be there. So if you wanted to watch it again, if there's something that you missed or you need to catch, or you want your family member to watch it, you're welcome to. Um, and then if you do have any questions outside of this if it comes to mind just email us and inshallah we'll respond uh don't believe we've missed any questions if you do happen to like do any of the recipes in the book ah. maybe you could share some photos of that because we could send that back to the authors and say look our students have tried and this was their feedback and also maybe we could get something going on social media perhaps 
um, with uh, uh, Lisa, perhaps, and you could just encourage people to look. Look, this is this is a healthy stuff. Not not not. This is like my mum's deep fried samosas. We don't not that, but specific like healthy um, recipes that you've done, either the ones from the book or, or your own ones to share. So that's a way of educating other people as well. So it's a way of teaching and and you know more good deeds as well in that way. Uh, Brilliant. Okay. So from now until Ramadan, we've got two weeks to think about our schedules, to think about what changes we need to make, to slowly start making those, inshallah, positive changes into our lifestyle. And a big key message which you heard our principal say is, look, the college will support students who need it. So if things are difficult, speak to your progress coach, speak to your subject teacher, and inshallah, we'll find ways to help you. Final request for me, um, please fill out that link for the feedback form. I've put it in the chat. Please fill that out. And 15th of Shaban. Yeah, I forgot totally. Look, look, guys, look, uh, uh, in, uh, I'm going to do that in my khutbah. In, the, in case khutbah, he'll, he will cover it. It's quite important. 15th of Shaban is potentially, I think, is it the weekend, Sunday, Monday? Uh, is it Saturday, Sunday, Monday? Something like that. Yeah. But that's uh, a very important uh, time. Uh, we'll, we'll hopefully put some links there as well for some more information about that. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah. Uh, that's going to be in the next couple of days inshallah. so yeah my normal friday reminder i'll try and address 15th of shaban as a reminder inshallah and please keep us all in duas uh, bless you lot for attending you know we pray for good things for everyone and may allah increase us all in, in that which is good and inshallah you know have a blessed ramadan yeah. and we'll, we'll catch up have a safe blessed break stay safe stay healthy get some rest do as much good as you can and inshallah we'll, we'll catch up again when we see you and in two weeks, inshallah. So, okay. so, take care, inshallah. So, okay. Bye bye. Nice. I bless you, Lord. Thank you. Bless you. <laughs> Fill out the form. <laughs>